Hi, I'm Ted Haftegaber, founder and producer of Live Talks Los Angeles. Thanks for joining us. Since we started over a decade ago, we have brought you hundreds of conversations with storytellers, writers, actors, musicians, humorists, chefs, and thought leaders in business and science. You can watch and hear most of these in our YouTube channel and our podcast. For details, visit livetalksla.org. And now, Here's the show you've tuned in to see. You guys, thank you so much for being here this evening. You are in, myself included, for quite a treat. I have to tell you, I get to talk to people all day. It's what I do, whether it's on television, whether it's podcasting, but you are one of the most interesting people. And I'm not just saying it because you're sitting right here in front of me. You truly are. And if you don't know, as my mom would say, you're going to learn today. <laughs> okay? <laughs> Shall we get into it? Let's start right from the beginning, your book, Dying of Politeness. Um, first of all, I love the title. And it, it drew me in immediately. I thought, OK, where, where are we going with this? Right. What does this mean? And you very well explain it throughout the book with so many stories. There's so many twists and turns. But I want to start with a story at the beginning. You write about a car ride yeah. from your early childhood where you quite literally almost died at the hands of a family member um, <laughs> from being too polite. Right. Can you share that story with everyone here? Yeah, sure. <laughs> so uh, that's where I get the idea for, for the title from. Uh, I was about eight years old, and my parents and I went out to dinner with my great uncle Jack and great aunt Marion. And Uncle Jack was driving, who's who was 99, <laughs> at night, and, uh, and he had these giant yellow goggles on, and I don't know what they were for. <laughs> but you know, and he's a thousand years old, and he's driving, and I'm sitting right behind him, and then my parents are here, so we're on a blessedly empty, narrow street. But he keeps kind of veering into the other lane and then veering back. And we're all like, oh my god. And so my, my mom decides to pick me up and put me in between them, mm -hmm. so presumably that I would die less when <laughs> we had the head-on collision. So, uh, so, you know, so th then he veers into the other lane and now a car is coming. And there's nowhere, it's very narrow, nowhere to anybody to pull off. And he's just heading for their car. And uh, nobody says anything, <laughs> nothing. And we are within uh, you know, two seconds of having a head-on collision. And uh, Marion finally says, a little to the right, Jack. <laughs> he, he veers over. And the car goes by like, and their faces are like, ah! <laughs> And, uh, and you know, I didn't, it was only later that I realized my parents would have rather die and their daughter die than say, hey, Jack, uh, <laughs> let alone pull the fuck over when you're going to kill us all, you know. So thankfully, I lived to write this book. Yes, thankfully. After all that. <laughs> and so many other things that wow. you have contributed to. And we're going to get into all of that. And that's just one of the fantastic, fun, now funny, that yes. we are, we're on the other yes. side of it. No. Story that, stories that are in your book. Now, you describe wanting, knowing that you wanted to be an actor from a very young age. Right. And you even wrote in your yearbook that you intended to, quote, go to the big city and become a star. Where did you get that drive from? You know, uh, I'm not sure, because my parents said that when I was three, I announced that I was going to be in movies. I, I don't even, do three-year-olds know people have jobs? And, first, and how do you know that you could be in a movie? I don't, I don't know how I knew that. But that's what I said, evidently. And it never, ever wavered. That was it. That was what I was going to do. 
I love that. And I, what I also love is that you have so many different life experiences, starting from young age, from you going to Sweden. I would love for you to kind of tell the story of going to Sweden and right. how that spending that year there shaped you. Yeah, yeah. So when I was a junior in high school, um, my school was going to start a foreign exchange program. Mm -hmm. And I immediately said, oh, I want to do it. I'm doing it. I have to, have to do it. I told my parents, can we possibly get the money? And, uh, and I think, now a bit in hindsight, that, um, that I desperately wanted to reinvent myself because mm -hmm. I was always the tallest kid in class and I made all my I was a little just kind of misfitty and, uh, and incredibly shy and awkward and gangly and everything. Anyway, so I thought, I go to somewhere, someplace else and I can, maybe they don't know that I wore those shoes. So, um, <laughs> uh, uh, so I signed up and I'm waiting for them to show me the list of fabulous countries I could go to and they said, there's one slot in Sweden that, where you can go. And I was, great, I have no idea where that is or what they speak, but I will go there. And, uh, and so I'm, uh, and I was very excited, you know, picking the clothes and everything. And I'm on the plane and uh, waving. My parents, you knew at that point you could come to the gate. And my parents are waving at me through the window. And I'm like, so in other words, I won't be seeing a single person I know for a year. <laughs> oh, my God. And so before the plane took off, I was like, this has been a horrible mistake. <laughs> And uh, I got there, and it was so confusing. And, uh, and uh, all, I said, I got to call my parents and let them know that I got here. So I said, I have to come home. This is the worst <laughs> idea. I don't know. What, why didn't anybody explain what it was going to be like? So two days later, I, they dropped me off at high school, you know, Swedish high school. And uh, I meet the principal, who speaks very good English. And, well, she's going to show you to your class and I'm in a history class, and uh, it's in Swedish. <laughs> and I was like, okay, well, nobody thought about this part either. <laughs> but go, what, what, what's the plan here? I, I, you know, I, all I had learned by that point was to say, I have a sore throat. <laughs> so unless she was gonna teach the history of, of sore throats, I, I was not gonna understand this class. So. Uh, so I, I, she told, the teacher told me what the assignment was, and I uh, went home and looked up every single word of the five pages in the dictionary and tra like translated the book. But I learned it fast. I learned it very fast. You learned the language. Yeah. In a, less than a year. Oh, God. Oh, yeah. No, I was fluent after about four months. I was thinking in Swedish by four months. Oh, my goodness. I was dreaming in Swedish, yeah. Do you still speak? Yeah. Can you say something? <laughs> Can you say that I have a sore throat? Jag har ont i halsen. There is this common theme through the book, and we kind of touched on it because it's the title of the book, where there are these instances where you are too often polite or too polite to use your voice, calling it your quote, don't make trouble Massachusetts self. When did that moment change for you? where you maybe stopped being so polite and you started to use your voice in a different way? Well, it was a gradual process. I, I mean, I felt it. I really knew that I wasn't. And the older I got and the more adult situations I got in, the more I wanted to be able to say what I thought. But like when I first started, <clears throat> started dating, for example, I only had one date in high school and he didn't ask me out again. But uh, <laughs> that's okay. Uh, but when I actually did start dating, it was a nightmare because I didn't want to say what restaurant I wanted to go to, what food I wanted to eat, I, you know, I, I, because he might not like whatever choice I make. I didn't want to say what I wanted on pizza. Mm. Um, I was that like fear, fearful of being judged. So, um, <clears throat> but you know, I started to grow and grow, and especially having experiences working on movie sets and all that stuff. Um, but um, but it really <clears throat> sort of exploded for me when I did uh, when I made Thelma and Louise and, and got to work with the, ah, ah yes, oh yes. we're gonna get to Thelma and Louise you know it yes anyway. you know it yeah. 
Um, when you first moved to New York City in 1978, you began your job at Ann Taylor. Mm -hmm. You invented a genius stunt, and I would love for you to share that story. Right, right. So I was a sales girl there, and uh, and I was very, I thought it was very chic store, Ann Taylor. And uh, so I had wore Ann Taylor clothes and always fully made up and everything. And uh, and one day I noticed that there was um, in the window, in the front window, it was on 57th and 5th. Uh, there were two mannequins sitting uh, in chairs at a, like a cafe table with fake food on the table, and there was a, a an empty chair in between them. And I keep looking out there, and I said, dare me to go get in the window and, and sit in that chair. And they were like, yeah, go, go. So I go out there, and I, I sit in the chair. <laughs> There's a couple of people looking in the window. And I hadn't really thought about what I would do once I sat in the chair. <laughs> so I decided I would pretend to be a mannequin, so I froze. And, uh, and they stand there watching. Is that what she's going to do? And then other people came up and said, what are you, what are you looking at? And they said, just wait. So, and then more people came and said, what are you all looking at? Just wait. Because uh, they figured I had a blink or move or something mm -hmm. eventually. And so finally I, I moved like a robot and they were like, whoa! <laughs> and then other people came up and then I froze again immediately. Like, what, 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 what just happened? Just wait. So anyway, a huge crowd gathered and uh, the manager heard all the noise and came and said, oh, oh my God, Gina, get out of the window! Get out of the window! <laughs> Actually, stay in the window. <laughs> and uh, uh, then they started hiring me every Saturday to be a mannequin oh in the window. Oh my gosh. Were you the inspiration behind the movie? What? Mannequin. Is I there, just thought about that. Is there somebody who pretended to be a mannequin? Yeah. Well, no, she was a mannequin. That's a whole other oh, story. She was, she was a mannequin. It was like this. Yeah. I, Not I, quite I was the, the inspiration thing, but for that. Yeah, yeah. I'm thinking so. Now, one of the many things you did, you were a model. How did modeling help you land your debut role in Tootsie? Okay, so uh, I studied acting at Boston University, mm -hmm. and it was called the theater program, and, and everybody wanted to go to theater, into theater, but except I knew that I wanted to be in movies. That was, there was no question. But, uh, but they didn't say anything. I didn't even think to ask them, where should I go to be in movies once I graduate? They didn't mm -hmm. give any advice like that. And everybody was going to New York so they could you know, try out for plays. And I went with them, but I had, came up with this plan that if I became a model, maybe people would start just offering me movies because Christy, that was happening to Christy Brinkley. She was doing little parts and things, and, and Lauren Hutton too. And I said, ah, so if I just become a, a supermodel, <laughs> which will be so much easier than becoming an actor, uh, I will, of course, just, just be handed movies. So. This was my big uh, scheme, and uh, and so I started going. I, I made a list of the top agencies, and I went to the number one and number two, and everything. And, and each one said, "You're you're too old and, and too tall," because I was 22 and six feet tall. And uh, then the next one, I said, "Well, I'm I'm 21 and 5'11 and a half." <laughs> <laughs> Now I'm 20, and I am 5'11", and, and I kept shaving it down. And the, I'm not saying the, the fifth one, it was because I was the right height and age, I mean, you, you, but, but they, I did get signed by the fifth one when I was 5'10 and, and 18. And what age? Yeah. And 18, okay. <laughs> when you were on the set, you worked with Dustin Hoffman, obviously, in this movie. What advice did he give you? He... From minute one, he decided that he was going to be well, going to mentor me in a way, mm -hmm. uh, and give me lots of advice. He seemed sure that I was going to have a career, and uh, um, all day long he'd be thinking of tips for when I, when I, my future self. And uh, uh, he, he, for example, the second day he said, "Come with me. We're going to dailies, which is when you look at the film that you shot the day before." But it's usually just the crew that mm -hmm. goes. I mean, usually the actors don't even go. And certainly not, a, you know, a, a young beginner like me. But he said, uh, so watch yourself. And if, if there's something you thought you were getting across and you see that it didn't come across, then you could say, all right, well, maybe I could try that in another scene now that I know and let her know. And so, uh, so I've, everything I've done, I've watched the dailies. I, I mean, I... 
There's a lot of actors that don't even want to watch themselves at all, but I'm like, mm, there's my movie. <laughs> <laughs> Let's watch it again. Uh, but, uh, but, the, but you might be talking about this one bit of advice he gave me was uh, never sleep with your co-star because it's just, you know, just awkward. It doesn't work out. It's not good. So just, just don't do that. But so here's what you say if you get propositioned mm -hmm. by your co-star. You say, oh, I would love to. You're very handsome, but I don't want to ruin the sexual tension between us. Oh. <laughs> So I squirreled that away, <laughs> and very soon after that, I had to use it. I was it. just about to ask. <laughs> I had to use it. So my model agency, uh, uh, my, the head of my model agency decided he was going to take me and a couple other uh, models that could act out to L.A., meet casting directors or whatever. Maybe, maybe he'd launch a branch out there, whatever. So, so the three of us went uh, with Zoli, and he knew Jack Nicholson really well. And so every night, we had dinner with Jack Nicholson, the three of us and Zoli and Jack Nicholson. And uh, 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 so, so uh, one night, we came home from, uh, from uh, and during the day, we'd go meet casting directors, whatever. Mm -hmm. And uh, I came home to the hotel, and there was a note under the door that said, uh, call Jack Nicholson. I was like, oh my god. And, and I was sharing a room with, with Barbara, and I said, look at this, call Jack Nicholson. I'm saving this for the rest of my life. I'm call now I'm calling Jack Nicholson. Hello, Mr. Nicholson. This is Gina Davis, the model. How are you? You called me. He said, hey, Gina. <laughs> When's it going to happen? <laughs> I was like, what? what? Oh, no. No, Mr. Nicholson, no, no, no. You, you've got, got the wrong idea. And uh, he said, no, come on. I'll send a car over. Come on. Come over. And I said, well, Jack, <clears throat> I would love to because uh, you're very attractive. Uh, <laughs> but um, I have a strong feeling that we are going to be working together at some point. And I would hate to have ruined the sexual tension between us. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And so, he, he took that? No, I, well, he said, oh, man, where'd you get that? Oh, <laughs> man. But he accepted it. So, yeah. I would imagine stepping on such a big set with such legendary actors like Tootsie was pretty intimidating. Yeah. How did you navigate that? Well... Uh, for whatever reason, maybe maybe it's because I thought, well, this was what was supposed to happen anyway, but I wasn't nervous. And uh, in fact, I, I started, the first scene I shot was with just me and Dustin, and I was in underwear, and uh, because he's, you know, he's pretending to be a woman, and they, we share a dressing room, and he walks in, and I'm like, just in bra and panties. But, uh, uh, after a few takes, and then Dustin walked into the door by accident, and I had Lib like say, "Hey, okay, hey, look, come on in." And uh, Sidney Pollack said, "Can I ask you something? Why are you not nervous?" And uh, I said, "Well, sh should I be?" He said, "What?" <laughs> well, that's Dustin Hoffman, and you're in your underwear, and I do, it's your first day. I just don't get it. And I was like, "I don't know," but I, I think it might have been because I had an idiotic certainty that it would ha it just would happen. Mm -hmm. I was going to say, you've been preparing since you were three years old yeah. for this moment. Yeah. And it was meant to be. Yeah. You were ready. Stay ready. You don't have to get ready. <laughs> um, I want to read a quote from your book. You said, quote, I kicked ass on screen way before I did so in real life. This is so interesting to me. So how did your roles on screen transform your experience with power? Well, yeah, it was kind of extraordinary that I got to play parts um, where, the, where the, the woman I was playing was far more confident and bold and, you know, um, um, uh, sure of herself. You know, got to play women who were deciding their own fate, mm -hmm. you know, and, uh, and had a big arc and all that. And so I was playing people that I would never have, that I was not like whatsoever in real life but but then it kind of made me feel more like that you know that, that it's, it's like faking it till you make it I think mm. acting it till you 
can can become it is is another tactic you could use. No, and, for uh, sure. It really helped. Yeah. Of all the movies that you've done, which one is your favorite, or was your favorite to shoot? To shoot. Okay. Uh, Long kiss, good night. Long kiss, good night. Really. <gasps> and oh. and why? Um, it was so much fun. Well, number one, Samuel Samuel Jackson is just like the greatest guy in the world. We had the, so much fun. We just adored each other. And, uh, and he says, too, in his interviews and whatever, that that's his favorite movie and his favorite Aww. part. And, and so, uh, yeah, so we loved it. But, but also, I got to do such incredible stuff. I mean, I was like the baddest badass ever. And I, I was the first, uh, I was the first female actor to say on screen, suck my dick. Are you serious? You're the first? I don't know that there's been a lot of them after that, <laughs> I, but I did say that, yes. yes. <laughs> and, and my character deserved to say that. Good. Yeah. I can't believe that, that was the first time. That is powerful. Where's that in the GDIQ? Where's that fall? What's that? Where's that fall in your GDIQ? Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, I know a lot of people probably want to get into the Thelma and Louise of it all, and you just celebrated 30 years, 30 year anniversary of the movie, which we should clap for because <laughs> the movie's so incredible and it impacted people in, in so many different ways for various reasons. And I'm not talking about Brad Pitt. I'm not talking about um, but. For you, how did Susan Sarandon impact your life while on set? She completely changed my life, um, which I didn't anticipate or expect. I'd never met her, and, and, and you know, I was cast as Thelma, and she was cast as Louise. And Ridley asked if we would, just the three of us, meet together and go through the script, see if anybody had any ideas about little changes they wanted. So, uh, so I had maybe four things, that, like maybe a little line change or something. And I planned out, I literally planned out the most girly possible ways I could bring up each thing. I said, well, this one, I can make it seem like a joke. And then, but maybe he'll say, actually, but good point, you know, or mm -hmm. say, and, and I like to say, and then, well, this one I can ask on set. That's a small one. And I can just say, would you mind if I, if I do this <laughs> instead? And, uh, and all that. So I'm prepared. And Susan walks in and I'm like bowled over by her immediately. She's so confident. and and wonderful, and we sit down and crack open the script, and, and I swear Susan says, this first line, I don't think we need it. We should just cut that. And I was like, wait a minute, what? You, and, and I look at Ridley, and he's like, you know, you're right. That's uh, like, what's happening here? <laughs> I mean, that's how unbelievably stunted I was mm -hmm. in my view of how a woman could be in the world. And we went through the whole, script like that and she's just like, hey, I had an idea for a new scene. What? Uh, so, and then every day was like that. It was like, I had, I, somehow I just never spent time with a woman mm. who says what she thinks very easily, um, not confrontational, not, you know, anything like that, but uh, uh, without qualifiers in front of it. I had probably never said anything where I didn't say, I don't know what you think. This is probably a stupid idea. Well, maybe I shouldn't. Okay, what about, you know, and, and she just says, let's do this. Let's not do this. And it was like three months of just witnessing this, and right. it really rubbed off on me. It really I believe did. it. Yeah. You weren't dying of politeness after uh, yeah, that. Yeah, <laughs> not as much, not as much. Your role in the adaptation of Ann Tyler's The Accidental Taurus won you the Academy Award. <laughs> For you, what did that experience feel like and what drew you to that character? Oh, so yeah, I had read the book. Mm -hmm. um, I was a big fan of Ann Tyler and I was like, oh, somebody's gonna get to play this part and I hate her uh, <laughs> because I wish I could play this part. But um, I managed to actually land it. And, uh, and so the question was, how, how, did, how did I prepare for that? Yeah, what, what did that experience feel like? Playing that, winning the Academy Award right. for such a powerful role? Right, what right. Drew, well, I know what drew you to it. You love the book. And yeah. <laughs> um, 
it was incredible. I mean, that was such a good script and such a good role, and uh, you know, working with incredibly talented people. It was it was it was so much fun. Oh, so I, well, I'll tell you a funny story. So I got nominated, of course, and. Uh, uh, not of course. I mean, I mean. <laughs> well, we know the end of the story now. No, no, no. no. Yes, yes. You were nominated. <laughs> oh my God, that's terrible. I didn't mean that. Anyway, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> it's still in her. <laughs> anyway, uh, I'm, I'm getting dressed and ready, and uh, you start putting on pounds of makeup like at eight in the morning or something to get there. So uh, I'm all ready and I'm all dressed. And I decide I'm going to have a, have a meal before I go. So I, I made a, a bowl of spaghetti, and I had a big sheet over me, and uh, put on the TV. And it was right at the moment where the Oprah Winfrey show was on, and she had like five <clears throat> movie critics, like Siskel and Ebert mm -hmm. and all these people. And they were on the Best Supporting Actress category to predict. You just wanted to know what their opinions were. And one by one, they went down the line. And, uh, <clears throat> and somebody said, I think it was uh, Gene Siskel said, <clears throat> I think Gina Davis was miscast because I think she was too pretty to play that part. And uh, Rex Reed said, too pretty, she's too ugly. <laughs> she has eyes like big navel oranges. <laughs> really? Anyway, and I'm like, but, but they all unanimously said, the only person that for sure is not getting it is Gina Davis. No! Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I was like, oh, well, I guess I should still go. You know, it'll, be, it'll be nice anyway. And, and so, uh, so I went, and then it was the first, first award of the night, and then they, they said my name. And it was just like, went into some other altered universe. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. You, they were probably in your head, and you probably weren't thinking anything of it, and then... No, no, yeah. Then it was in your face. Take that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, what was your favorite memory from A League of Their Own? Oh, gosh. <laughs> yeah, and this year is the 30th anniversary of that movie. Um, yeah, oh, there was so much. Fun. It was so much fun. <clears throat> well, learning how to play baseball was, was mm -hmm. one thing because uh, as tall as I was, of course, everybody wanted me to play basketball or something <laughs> in, in high school, but I was very, uh, what I would call, physically shy. I didn't want to like, have anybody watch me do anything. And then I became an actor. <laughs> Doesn't make sense, but that's okay. Uh, uh, so... So I didn't know how to play any sport, and then mm -hmm. I got cast to play like this phenomenal baseball player. So I had to learn, but, but it was really amazing at 36 to find out that I had athletic ability. It was like astounding, so, so that was really fun. Yeah, you could do the splits and catch the ball. <laughs> What's that? Can you still do the splits? Oh, sure. <laughs> oh, I was like, what? <laughs> Great question. <laughs> no, but I'll tell you. Uh, so I knew that was coming up, and I said, Penny, put it, you know, toward the, so I have time to really work up to being able to do it. And then, uh, and I wasn't practicing, I didn't, wasn't practicing, but, uh, but I, and then it was like, oh, it's in four days. Uh, oh, uh-oh. So I <laughs> stretched and stretched and stretched, and so it turned out on the day, I was able to do it, you know, I was able to go and go into a split. There was no way I was getting up. <laughs> you know, people said they go it was and then they go and, and just stand up again. And then, yeah, no, I didn't have any of those muscles at all. So. so you did it in one take. Well, no, I could go in the split oh, any oh. number of times, but then somebody else. <laughs> got you. It was actually a guy in my uniform got stood you. up, and then I go. You know. <laughs> Um, you have been such a, a pioneer for the quality or quality roles that are available to women in Hollywood. Was there a, one particular moment for you when you realized that you needed to be an advocate for change? Yes, it, a very specific moment. So I became a mother uh, rather later in life at 46. And when my daughter was 
about two, I said, hey, wait, we can watch preschool shows now, and put her on my lap, and put on a show, and I immediately noticed, I mean, within t five or 10 minutes, I noticed, what, how many female characters are on this show? This is a, a show made for little kids. And I'm Googling it, and, and uh, they, you know, there, was, there was one female character. And, I'm, and then uh, and I saw it everywhere. Then we, this video we rented, or this movie that just came out, um, I would notice that there was very, very few, usually one main, you know, major female character, but that was it. And, uh, and I'm, I realized immediately, because I'm see, see, thinking about this through my daughter's eyes, that, in other words, so we're teaching kids that boys are more important than girls from minute one. If, we don't, if they're not equal, you know, I had assumed that kids you know, I knew there was lots of, uh, you know, gender disparity mm -hmm. in general in my industry, and uh, which was unfortunate, but I knew all about it. But I assumed kids' stuff would be absolutely equal, you know. Right. And uh, it was stunning to find out that it wasn't, because I could see sort of global implications for that. You know, we all are, uh, so many people are trying so hard to get rid of uh, gender bias and you know, overcome it. But once you have it, it's very difficult. Mm -hmm. So why are we training kids to have it from the very beginning? So um, I didn't intend to like let it take over my entire life, but, um, but, but first I would just, you know, I have meetings all the time in Hollywood with whoever, and I would always say, hey, by the way, have you ever noticed how few female characters there are in movies made for kids? And every single person said, that's not true anymore. That's been fixed. No, 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 that's not true. And, uh, uh, and so a lot of times they would name a movie with one female character as proof that it was <laughs> over. You know, uh, they, they, uh, uh, Several people said, there's been Belle, you know, from... <laughs> from the movie where she gets Stockholm Syndrome. But, um, <laughs> but still, you know, she reads. She's, no, it's a great yes. character. Uh, right. She reads. But uh, so I realized, okay, this is completely unconscious. Because these people are telling me how much they care about girls, how they, everything about them, they want to do right by them. I have daughters. And I'm like, they just don't see what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. So if I was to get the data and go directly to them. Like, I don't have to educate the public. If I could yeah. get them to change, you know, then the job is done. So, uh, so I, did, I got massive amounts of data um, uh, research done and made an appointment with a big studio and said, can I come in and share this with you? And, uh, and they were stunned. Their jaws were on the ground. They, had no, they were like, what? We, all, all we want to do is be good for kids, and we never thought about this. And so, uh, and, and we've had that reaction everywhere we've been. Um, and, and have, uh, there's been a lot of change. There's been a great amount of change. Th that definitely deserves a hand clap. Most people talk about it. They don't just say, you, I, love, I love, you're so humble. It's like, no, you created an institute for it and research and everything. So that's, it's, it's absolutely incredible. There was a part in your book that I want to read where you say, here's my theory of change. There's one category of gross inequality in our culture where the underrepresentation of women can be fixed overnight. And then you say, on screen. Right. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Right, right. Well... You know, if you think about the sectors of society, almost every one is, is very imbalanced as far as males and females, you know, whether it's law, politics, uh, medicine, you know, there's, there's so much um, disparity. Think about the CEOs of the world and the boards and Congress and all that. So um, how long is it going to take to fix those? You know, it's going to be decades, yeah. you know. I mean, we're still talking about oh, could there ever be a female president? What a ridiculous conversation, you know. It should be absolutely equally likely that it will be a woman as a man. Um, we should just, you know, get there, mm -hmm. you know. I mean, clearly, yeah. clearly. Uh, but we're just, it's so slow. But we found through our research and, and, and doing this work for so long that, that when something happens on screen, 
it will happen in real life. Um, and there's a funny example of this. When, uh, when I took up archery, you know, I had a coach. And he called me a few years ago and said he was looking at the graph for participation in archery. And it was always men at the top and then boys, then women and girls at the bottom. Mm -hmm. And he said, and in 2012, the line for girls shot straight up vertically and became the top category of the most people shooting archery. So what happened in 2012? Hunger Games, Hunger Games and Brave, the uh, animated movie where there's a female archer protagonist. And girls left the theater and bought a bow. It was so instant. And we've done, I mean, too much to talk about, but another interesting study we did was Fox asked us to find out the impact of the Dana Scully character in X-Files. Mm -hmm. So we do this survey and study and found that 63% of women who currently work in STEM name Dana Scully as their inspiration. Wow. 63%, can you imagine? I mean, one character on one show. If, so, so in other words, yes, if we change it on screen, it will happen in real life so much faster. So instead of art imitating life, life yeah. is imitating art. Life will imitate mm. art. I like that a lot. Now, did you see how she just casually mentioned that she's into archery? <laughs> just, just casually, like, like, like we all do it or we all can do it. She's a champion archer, <laughs> you guys. So how did the sport teach you to quiet the voice in your head and find your inner peace? Yeah, so archery is, it turns out, to be just a battle with yourself. The, the, forget about anybody else, because it's so finely, to, you know, I mean, you're shooting, you're shooting an arrow at a, the center of the target is about that big, uh, 70 meters away. And so, you know, the slightest thing can throw it off. So if you were to get nervous, oh, I, I really need to get a bullseye on this one or something. Now you ruined the shot. I mean, oh, any thought you have will ruin the shot. So I didn't know this at first. And I was shooting one time and my coach said, what were you just thinking when you shot that? I said, oh, I was thinking I suck. And he was like, <laughs> okay, all right, keep shooting. And then another time he asked me, what, did you, what were you thinking? Uh, that time I was thinking, you think I suck. <laughs> <laughs> And he said, okay, well, so we, you gotta work, we gotta work on that inner voice. And it made me realize, oh my God, this, hap this is going on all day. There's mm -hmm. a running dialogue in my head with everything I do. You did that wrong, you're doing this wrong, you know, people are gonna laugh at you, you're, um, you're not good at anything and, and all that. So um, not only for archery, but just in my life, I'd hear, my, hear that voice and I'd say, no, I'm doing the best I can. No, that's not true. I'm doing the best I can. I'm doing really good. And so it really changed a lot for me. Yeah. It really, really helped me quiet that voice. That's incredible. I would never know that sport could do that. I almost want to try. Almost. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> oh it's cool. You should. It's cool. It's cool. Uh, we're here talking about you and your stories and your book, Dying of Politeness. What are some of your favorite books and why? Oh, well... Let's see. Um, the first time I, when I read The Chronicles of Narnia, mm -hmm. I had to just keep reading it and reading it over and over. Love those books. Um, uh, when I was a teenager, the book I was obsessed with is called um, Imperial Woman by Pearl Buck. Uh, it's, it's, old, it's an old book, but it was about the last empress of China and her whole life and uh, experiences and beautiful descriptions of everything. I love that. Um, the book I gave to the most people was Backlash, which came out in uh, 92, I think. That's an incredible book. Uh, yeah, I sent it to everybody I knew because I, did, I just wasn't aware of that, you know, the, the, the backlash to feminism, which kind of exploded in the seven, early 70s and all that. Um, by 92, it was like devastating, mm. yeah. Um, you end your memoir on a very, very powerful note about your hope for your future grandchildren. Um, I want to read the quote. You say, I wasn't able to change the world before my daughter grew up. Though she's amazing and powerful and gloriously self-possessed anyway, 
But my fond hope is that one day she will be able to say to her daughter, should she be so blessed? You know, once upon a time, women and girls were thought to be less important than men and boys. And my gran granddaughter will turn to her with an incredulous look, then laugh and say, Mom, are you making this up? That'd be good, wouldn't it? Yeah. After making such a significant impact with the Gina Davis Institute on Gender and Media, what is your goal for the next generation? I, <clears throat> the, uh, the entire goal is, I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty big. <laughs> the, the goal is to um, get rid of gender bias, you know, I, and, and have, show kids that boys and girls share the sandbox equally, they do equally interesting and important things. They each take up half the space in the world and, uh, and have them be able to grow up feeling that. Mm. That's beautiful, yeah. I think at this time we're gonna open it up to some questions. Okay. First question, now that you've written a book and you're dabbling in writing, uh, would you consider writing for film or for television? Oh. Well, I, I, you know, I've, all, I've always had ideas for parts I want to play and um, always had ideas for sequels to movies that I've been in, every movie I, I, except Thumb and Louise. Uh, <laughs> we really are dead. Um, but, but I'm always like, oh, you know, I have ADD. I'm not going to be able to finish it. But I finished a book, so maybe I could write something. I don't know. I should try. I should try. Would we not love to see that? <laughs> Or, I mean, Sylvester, if I could write my own stuff, like Sylvester Stallone wrote Rocky for himself, and if I could do that, I'd be pretty good. I mean, you can. Yeah. Archery. Yeah. I mean, an institute. <laughs> <laughs> like, the All list right, goes fine. on and on. Everything you say you're going to do and set out to do, you do that and beyond. So we'll be waiting, right? Yeah. All right. All right. <laughs> Next no question, pressure. I commend you for the work you've done to bring gender equity in entertainment and media, but another effort worth fighting for is ageism. Would you comment about that, please? Yeah, yeah. Um, at my institute, we actually study age, ageism, uh, the ages of characters. We, we look at um, six categories altogether, all the underrepresented segments of society, and, uh, and age, uh, people over 50 are, are one of them. Um, and we found that in films, uh, the current status, uh, status statistic is that only 5% of the characters are women over 50. So that's a tiny piece of the pie, you know, for us to fit in that little space. Uh, so, you know, and, and there's body size and sure. LGBTQ and, you know, uh, race and ethnicity and, and uh, disabled people with disabilities and, and it, you know, there's so much that um, where we're not reflecting society. It's not controversial. Mm -hmm. I just would love the fictitious worlds to reflect the real world, you know, which has a, a fair amount of, of uh, people who are not really reflected now on the screen. Absolutely. In an interview I recently saw, you said you wouldn't want your parents to read your book. I'm curious, what parts specifically would you not want them to read? And, if, and there has to be something in the book you would like them to read. Oh, oh no, there's plenty in the book that'd be fine for them to read, but I don't think a lot of it I wouldn't have put in there if they were still alive, I have to say. You really? Know? Yeah, like, I never, I never told them, but I didn't graduate from college. They, <laughs> they never know. Some, I don't know how. Uh, <laughs> I convinced them, because wouldn't they have thought I would have a, have a graduation ceremony that I would <laughs> invite them to, but I took a lot of incompletes because I was really only interested in the acting stuff and, uh, you know, the history, whatever. Uh, and so, um, but I told them that I graduated. And then I had to lie in every interview uh, about that. And it's probably still on Wikipedia that I graduated from Boston University, so. Uh, but, and there's stuff about sex. <laughs> <laughs> that they might read about. Yes, oh, more? <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, what is your advice for filmmakers on how to create gender equity and diversity when pitching or creating films with large studios and financiers while encouraging them to feature the stories of women in films more? Well, um, it sounds like you're wondering, wondering why studios don't want to have more uh, diversity, but actually they really do. Everybody, they've all got a, um, a division that, that works on that, and, um, but it's just, it's just this kind of unconscious bias. And part of the reason I think women aren't cast in older roles is because writers, Add a fe put a female character if there needs to be. This character mm -hmm. needs to be female. But if it's the pharmacist, the, you know, the gardener, the whoever, it doesn't, you know, the, the uh, what's it called? The go-to person the, um, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, is, is male, mm -hmm. is male. Mm -hmm. And so if they just, what I suggest to uh, people creating content is before you make it, before you cast it, just uh, go through and say, who can, can, which parts can be played by a man or a woman or any type of intersectionality uh, and when this is written for a white man, who, you know, who else could play this part? And then, you know, let, uh, let uh, those, you know, all different kinds of people audition for the part and just pick who, who did the best. That would Absolutely. work. If you had all creative control to reprise the role of a Charlie Baltimore, oh. What would the plot line be, and who would you want to co-star? I'd love to see you kick some ass again with Hennessy. <laughs> oh, well, the co-star, it can't, it can't happen without Sam Jackson, I mean, uh, obviously. Um, whoever else wants to be in it, that's fine, as long as it's me and Sam. But, <laughs> but I've had fantasies about a sequel for that for a long time. We actually changed the ending. He, in the original script, he died in the end, and... Uh, test audiences were like, you're not killing Sam Jackson. <laughs> uh, so we, we, take, we reshot it and had him live so we could make a sequel. But I mean, maybe, you know, maybe still. We're, we're living in the era of it, like sequels, prequels, reboots, right. it's all happening. Absolutely, yeah. I think it could still happen. He's so busy. He's in every <laughs> he movie. He's on know. Broadway now. <laughs> <laughs> he is? Yeah, oh my Broadway. God, that's fabulous. <laughs> that's great, yeah. I'd like to know what's next for you on screen. Uh, so, well, uh, I have something in the can, um, which is called Pussy Island. <laughs> yes! <laughs> a, a, a movie I may not have signed on for if my parents were alive. <laughs> I don't know. But uh, it's Zoe Kravitz's mm -hmm. uh, directorial debut, mm -hmm. and she co-wrote it. And it's, it's a thriller, uh, and I get to be very, very funny in this movie. So, um, and, and Channing Tatum is, is the star, so that's what you'll probably next see me. Yeah. And, I, I and so far, in all the press, they haven't put P asterisk 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 Y island. It's just, I don't know what's happened to the culture now, but... <laughs> We're open. We're past <laughs> it. Uh, you name a movie, Pussy Island, and put up a poster with that on it. Yeah. And the final book is about uh, the writing of the book. Uh, it's, a it's a collection of essays. Did you set your mind to uh, do a, a, a memoir in that format? Did you write all these essays in several sittings, in one sitting? How did the, how did the, what was the process for writing the book? Oh, well, I don't think of it as essays, I, I think it's, cha it's, it's chapters, I think, you know, mm -hmm. they, it's chronological and they flow into each other. Um, so that's, yeah, that's what was the, the goal that I had. It was interesting to, because first I just collected all the things that I wanted to talk about, you know, I had cards with them and everything. Um, and it was, uh, so it was interesting to see, well, what relates to what and how can I yeah. tie these things together, so. Uh, but it was very interesting. I, it turns out I love to tinker. Because uh, once I had it kind of all planned out, I just tinker, tinker, tinker. <laughs> they had to yank it out of my hands. Really? <laughs> yeah, oh. Why now? Why oh. was now the time to write this book? I mean, you've been working on it, but for it to come out. Uh, well, well, yeah. I mean, I had, I had thought about writing a book for a while because mm -hmm. I, you know, I. 
all the things that happened to be really stuck in my head. <clears throat> but uh, it was when I realized, uh, and this is now a couple of years ago, I realized what the theme could be, because I didn't, I didn't you know, it can't just be whatever. It, it, there has to be a reason that I write it. And it was because, it was about, so it's about how playing parts that were bolder than I was, it's what, what you read out of the book, uh, changed my life mm -hmm. so that I could become more like them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was, that was what it's about. That was our last question. Hey, oh. all right. <laughs>